I was able, with the success I'd had as an actor in mainstream film, it allowed me to at least be able to make these smaller films. Son, you're a politician. And that were, were the stories I wanted to tell about the America that I saw. I remember the end of the Second World War, there was a lot of sloganeering in the country about, it, it was all red, white, and blue talk, and how great we were. And we are great, we're a great country. Did Deep Throat say that people's lives are in danger? Yes. What else did he say? He said everyone is involved. But when I became a filmmaker, I wanted to tell a story about the America that I grew up in that was different than the one that was being popularized. I lied to the American people. I lied about what I knew. It, what I would say a gray zone. It was a gray area that wasn't being touched on, where things were more complex. And so that Sundance became an extension of that, giving other people a chance to do the same thing. But what I wanted to do is to create a mechanism where new artists would have a place to come develop. And I would call on my own colleagues who were experienced. They were uh, writers, directors, actors, cinematographers, editors. Would they come up for a period of about a month? To the only place I could afford to give over was the property in Utah in the mountains. Would you come up and work with these new filmmakers? At the time, I didn't know it was going to last or not. You could see that we were, we were building some, some new talent, and they were being able to get their movies made. Who are your names? Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange. Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? And then there was Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino. Mathematics is the language of nature. Darren Aronofsky and Pi. You had Kimberly Pierce and Boys Don't Cry. And there's a number of films that came no. through. Why not? You're beautiful. And that allowed me to stay alive because it got just enough attention for me to keep going. But it was a rough road for about 10 years with Sundays. But the mainstream wasn't allowing any space in the theater for it. So, well, it'd be sad to have just evaporate after the, they, they come through this lab. So maybe what we can do is create a festival and have them gather and just create a community of, of filmmakers to look at each other's work. The next thing was to, how do you get people in Utah, a lot of people see Utah as a theocratic state, you know, you have a culture that's very religious, basically. And that religion doesn't seem to, let's just say, it would frown on, on the kinds of films. So what are you doing? You're crazy. I said, well, maybe that's why we should do it. We should, we should make this weird. What are you doing up in Utah? Well, let's make it in the winter. Now it's really getting weird. Maybe it's just so weird, people will come because it's weird. When I think about the first year when we only had one theater there, the old Egyptian theater, and there was no promotion, there was nothing, you know, no support. When some of these films came through, Quentin's film, and then Soderbergh's film, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, suddenly there was an attention there in Park City that didn't exist, and we were able to survive, but just barely. Uh, I think Roger Ebert was the first real supporter, and he stayed that way all the way through. I will be forever indebted to Roger and to Harvey Weinstein. That's why Harvey Weinstein was so valuable, because he came in and he wanted to, to buy films there and then build them into something that, was, that could be considered more mainstream. Now, I didn't feel that that was our mission, to, to see who buys. It was our mission just to show the work. Things started to move with Hoop Dreams. Well, Hoop Dreams was a documentary that came in the mid-90s. Suddenly, documentaries stepped up a level. Can I watch you walk? Sure. So the people begin to look at them differently rather than just something that you do like, you know, castor oil. This is the story of us and our bands over seven years. And suddenly documentaries begin to really move and the support of them begin to move. And I was thrilled. <laughs> Things really started to move in the 90s. I thought, wow. Oh, I get it. People are coming here because they, they're going to be able to see something they wouldn't get to see normally in the, in the mainstream marketplace. Success is, it has a dark side. And I realized that the tension we were now going to be facing was going to be, because I, I didn't want us to be chasing the money, and it was, it was tempting to chase the money. 
there's a reason I didn't have this in the beginning in Beverly Hills or New York City. You know, it's gotten very big, obviously, but everybody's been super supportive. And I wanted it to be removed from that. I wanted it to be removed and isolated and more intimate, but completely free of any kind of influence that money can bring. I just feel that if we don't close this down now, it's going to grow itself into a mess. I don't think we can do what we started out to do anymore. That hasn't happened yet, but I, I don't. If that moment came, I, you know, what do you do? You ever see Manhattan? You ever see uh, the Seventh Seal, where they have these great dialogues with these great backgrounds? I think we created an aspiration. I think creating something new that gave people a chance who wouldn't normally have that chance to be seen, and to give audiences a chance to see something they might not normally see. That to me is a huge plus. If it's done that, then I'm happy.